um, uh, uh, put questions in the chat um, or just raise your hand um, and, you know, feel free to interrupt. We can always come back to it if it's not like uh, the greatest time for answering questions, but you know, I'm I'm hoping that you know this is open and you're you're free to ask whatever questions and get the information that you need tonight. Um, and I'd also just kind of out of curiosity, and so you all get to know each other as well. I'm just curious, and you can put this in the chat where you're calling from tonight, where you're zooming in from, and then what campus you're looking at, either the Kenmore or the San Diego campus. Um, so I am uh, located, I'm based out of the Kenmore campus, but I do uh, visit the California campus as well, because even though we're two campuses, we're essentially one ND program. <laughs> so it's the identical program on both campuses um, that's all under the same school here at Bastyr. So, so yeah, if you feel, feel uh open to chatting a little bit, feel free to, to put in your, your location and, and what you're looking at. So, and I'm going to move forward with our presentation. Can everyone see that okay, the slide deck? Okay. So let me know if anything does go weird here. We're just going to start by talking about some real basic stuff about naturopathic medicine. Uh, and I apologize, I'm looking back and forth on my other screen, but um, great. So yeah, interested in both locations, looking at San Diego, very popular, All right? Um, so naturopathic medicine, we'll talk just a little bit about the introduction to our wonderful naturopathic medicine and um, what really is the determining kind of the unique feature to naturopathic medicine is what I believe, um, you know, this is really the unusual thing that we bring that no other practitioner really brings in quite the same way. And that's the Vis Medicatrix Naturae, which is the healing power of nature. And what that means, it's not just about natural therapies, although we certainly learn lots of natural therapies in naturopathic medical school, but it really is about the ability for someone to heal and that inherent kind of um, ability that we all have um, that we recognize to some degree. But naturopathic doctors not only recognize this, we really kind of base our whole philosophy on this. Um, and the idea that your body is self-regulating, you can get back to health, or you can at least get back to the a layer of health for you as an individual, given all of your circumstances, conditions, genetics, environment, and so forth. But that every person has the ability to heal and self-regulate and, every, um, and everyone's capable of that with the right support. And that's whether the naturopathic doctor comes in, is really providing that support, um, supporting the VIS, um, and knowing the best way to do that for you, again, kind of given your circumstances, your environment, your genetics, and so forth. So that's really the the big thing that you learn in naturopathic medical school, um, is how to use and and use the V's to the to the greatest degree to facilitate someone's healing. Um, there are a lot of complexities to that, though. So what that does mean is that you need to know a lot of things to be able to really utilize that um, support well. You need to know not only kind of medical basics, but you also need to know the natural therapies. And you need to know how to apply them in a way where you can provide the least force that is needed in order to get the biggest effect. And that's really the kind of determining thing with naturopathic medicine that sets us apart from other practitioners. Because other practitioners certainly diagnose, they certainly treat, they certainly use natural therapies. It's really the philosophy that holds us together and kind of sets us apart. So, so there's a little bit more on that. And, and as I mentioned, the Vis Medicatrix Naturae is really our kind of guiding principle. But we do pay attention to all these other principles too. And it's very ingrained into the way that naturopathic physicians operate. So that means totally cause them, treat the cause. Primum non non sere, which is first do no harm. Um, do sere is doctor's teacher. Totally totem is treat the whole person. 
and preventare, of course, is prevention. So those are the six basic principles of naturopathic medicine that really are the underlying foundation to everything that we do. And I mentioned a little bit um, more about the VEAS here, um, but you can see, you know, it is really our role to support and facilitate um, and augment the process of identifying the things that in inhibit someone's ability to heal and remove those obstacles and support the body in that healing. So another layer of naturopathic philosophy is what we call the therapeutic order. And this is the idea that you use the least forced needed to get the biggest effect. So we have what um, we put all of our therapies and interventions really into this pyramid that you see here. Um, meaning that we, first of all, the, the most important thing we always do is establish the foundation for optimal health. And that can be anything from, you know, determinants of health, um, uh, which is probably a term that you've heard of. We talk a lot in medicine recently, especially about social determinants of health. But this is the idea that there are some things that everybody needs. Everybody needs a safe environment to live in, right? Everybody okay. needs to breathe. Everybody needs adequate hydration, good nutrition, um, sleep, um, stress management. Uh, all of these things are what we call the determinants of health. And it does also extend to the social determinants of health, such as things like your environment. You need to be in a safe and healthy environment. Um, economics. Socio um, determinants of health can also include like your, you know, your family, um, uh, the way that you live, you know, your family, your community, um, your job, your hobbies, all of these things go into determining your own individual health. And these are the things that we always try to optimize for us. batteries that work. Now you got this thing. You took my room. Then what we'll do is move on to things that more directly support the Vs Medicatrix Naturae, that support weakened systems, that address physical alignment. And then uh, finally, we would get to maybe doing some symptom control with either natural or synthetics. Um, or high force interventions in some cases um, where, you know, something needs to be suppressed um, or altered more drastically, such as the surgery. So in naturopathic medicine, we focus more on the bottom part of this period of this pyramid, but nothing is completely out of the question. It's just a matter of when it's the best time to apply these other levels of care. Um, and that is something that, you know, is part of the reason why you see so much variety in the way that naturopathic physicians practice, because some of them really do work on that kind of first and second level of care. And that's the type of things that they they uh, emphasize with patients. Others may do more high force interventions um, because that's reflective of the patients that, that they see and the way that they practice. So there's a lot of variety uh, kind of within our philosophy to practice in many different ways, depending on your individual focus as a practitioner. So. So the naturopathic modalities, I've mentioned a couple of these already, um, such as lifestyle changes um, and pharmaceuticals, but then we also do incorporate quite a bit of natural therapies. And that's often something that really interests people to kind of get into the field. Um, for me, it was nutrition and botanical medicine. I was really in love with both of those modalities. I wanted to study them more. And so that's kind of what initially drove me to look at naturopathic medicine as an option. For many people, it might be something like physical medicine. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, practitioners in our field who are former athletes and, you know, through their own, um, you know, uh, issues that arose and conditions they had, um, they got into physical medicine and they found that to be something that they wanted to learn more about and, and know how to use that with patients. Um, and for other people, that may be something like counseling, the mind-body connection, um, 
you know, being really interested in that kind of aspect of someone's health, and then also wanting to know how you use that therapeutically. So there's, again, there's a lot of variety in the different modalities that naturopathic physicians use. Um, and uh, you do learn all of these, at least in part within the naturopathic curriculum. So so scope of practice wise, um, there is variety also in the in the ways in which naturopathic medicine is regulated within this country. And I'm going to primarily talk about the US, although much of the same applies to Canada, um, if there's any Canadians on the call. Um, so the profession is regulated within a number of states. We're up to about 22 right now, as well as DC, Puerto Rico, um, and the US Virgin islands um, and naturopathic doctors in those states obtain either a registration or a license to practice um, their scope of practice can look different depending on where they are they may have for instance probably one of the biggest things that um, is different in between states is maybe the ability to prescribe medications in some states there might not be that ability within your own license to do that in others there might be so in Washington, for instance, we have a pretty wide scope of practice. In California, um, we it's not quite as wide, um, but there are many ways in which naturopathic doctors still operate really in all 50 states. Um, I have heard of NDs in virtually every single state. Um, who are practicing in some form or fashion. Now, they might not be practicing as true primary care physician in those states. Sometimes they're working with another practitioner. Sometimes they're working under another license. Um, sometimes they're working more as just a health consultant. And kind of one of the big thing that has been developing in the last few years is people who are strictly doing telehealth practices too. So they could be from anywhere and see patients from around the world. So um, there are many different ways in all of these jurisdictions that you can operate um, as a naturopathic physician with the training in from the a naturopathic medical school. Um, when you do graduate from a, the, an ND program that is accredited, you can take what we call MPLEX exams. Now, these are your licensing exams um, so that there's two and there's two parts. There's a step one, there's a step two similar to USMLE or many other professions where there are um, licensing exams that you take kind of throughout the curriculum and when you graduate. Um, these exams are very comprehensive and what it does is it tests all of your knowledge to make sure you are a competent and safe practitioner wherever you are practicing. Um, and I mentioned a little bit about scope of practice. If you want to know more about that, um, I would encourage you to look at our national association, um, the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Um, and I will send out this presentation to everyone afterwards so we can um, make sure that you have all of these slides. Um, you know, you can look at the AAMP, also all of the states. Um, virtually all of the states have a state association of some type as well. Um, and you can often contact the state association to find out a little bit more about what the practice is like in those areas. The ND scope of practice in Washington, I mentioned a little bit already. Um, so I'll just uh, give a couple highlights here. Like I mentioned, um, we can do uh, full diagnostics as a primary care physician in this state, um, as well as many of our modalities, including prescriptive authorities. Um, right now, we're not able to do some medications. Um, uh, but all others are allowed, as well as IVs and immunizations, minor office procedures, and, and lifestyle. In California, um, there is a restriction on the uh, term of physician. So most, of, so you'll see if you look at the California Association, it's California Naturopathic Doctors Association instead of naturopathic physicians. So that's, uh, people use a, a different term there. Um, but they can essentially act as a primary care physician. There are some exceptions such as suturing and certain uh, physical medicine techniques, as well as non-controlled uh, substances are not uh, within prescriptive authority for NDs in California. 
So, um, any questions so far before we move forward? Okay, great. Um, so, a little bit about our program here at Bastier. So, this is our mis mission and vision um, with a Bastier, this has long been um, the standing mission and vision has always involved, you know, primary care physicians, um, naturopathic physicians um, who care for health and well-being, who become leaders in the field, not as well as care for their own communities. And, you know, we're always adherent and in alignment with naturopathic philosophy and principles. Um, so definitely read through that if you have not seen it before. Uh, a few things that make our program unique. Um, so we do use a systems-based approach, um, to, to uh, particularly in the biomedical sciences and even in the clinical sciences. So instead of just having separate courses, we really try to integrate, you know, so when the week that you're studying, you know, the um, the eye, for instance, you're studying the eye in a lot of different classes all at once. So that integration really helps reinforce the concepts. It, you know, helps with retention. Um, it it kind of helps you dive a little more intensely into a particular subject at a time so that your attention is not in many different places um, all at once. And, you know, we try to do that as much as possible within the curriculum um, to reinforce that. Um, we do have a strong foundation in naturopathic clinical theory, and we do have either case-based classes or philosophy classes throughout the majority of the program, um, and we do try to incorporate that into the clinical setting as well. Um, instructors do use a lot of active and hybrid learning um, within courses, and this is probably something, you know, if you've been in school recently during COVID, you're probably quite used to this now. You know, it's kind of becoming increasingly and very quickly becoming the standard within an all of higher education that you're probably not just going to go to class and sit there for eight hours a day anymore. There's going to be a mixture of different ways in which you are obtaining your learning. Um, ours has always been a little bit different because we've always had the, a hands-on clinical portion and a lot of labs, you know, so when you're learning a lot of the skills of being a doctor, you are doing a lot of hands-on therapies. You're learning how to draw blood, you're learning how to take blood pressures, you're learning how to do joint manipulation. So all of those things, of course, have always been hands-on um, and will continue to be but we find that for a lot of lectures, for some case-based classes, they sometimes actually work just as well, if not better, um, in an online format. And so we have adapted um, many courses to be delivered in a slightly different way. So. Um, at the Seattle campus, there's a deep history of naturopathic medicine here, many practicing NDs. San Diego is a little bit newer, but certainly still has a lot of integrative medicine within the local community there. Um, and a growing ND community, partially because of vast air grads who stay there, and then also folks from other schools. Um, one advantage that we have is that you can easily transfer between both campuses. So as I mentioned at the beginning, it is the same curriculum delivered on both campuses, slightly different flavor, of course, but it is essentially, you know, uh, interchangeable. So we don't have different classes that you would take at one campus and not at the other. Clinical training, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but, you know, this is some details more about the clinical training. Um, we have community uh, clinic sites, um, but the majority of our training really does occur at our um, school-based um, teaching clinics um, that also offer practitioner care. Um, so uh, they're offered what we call team care, you know, where you would be working um, with a number of other students and a supervisor and sometimes a resident as well um, in, a, in a group team together. So your, your patients are not just your own, you know, you really get to learn from other students who might be on your shift, um, other students that are seen, you know, uh, in the clinic at the same time. Um, so there is um, some overlap there, you know, you, you do get exposure to different things. 
Um, we do have the opportunity for second credential, uh, dual degrees that are offered in Washington, um, as well as California. Um, and we are about to launch a new one, which is a certificate in functional medicine that will be available to students uh, starting next year as well. So um, dual degrees, it gives you different skills in some areas. Some people really um, appreciate that opportunity to have another license, um, particularly if you're practicing in a pre-licensed state for naturopathic medicine, um, or just to open up different opportunities, you know, um, and many people do have interest in multiple areas. So we make it as easy as possible for you to obtain a second credential if you would like one. And then we do have curriculum concentrations too in pediatrics and community health. Um, th those are both offered on the Washington campus right now. Um, we also hope to be growing those opportunities in the future. So program outcomes, um, I'm not going to read through this, but you can definitely read through this. It is widely available on our website as well. Um, but, you know, the primary thing that we are really trying to do with the program is have you become a safe and competent and confident naturopathic physician. Um, so everything really kind of feeds into that. That's the primary goal. So admission. Carrie, do you want to add a little bit here? Hi, I'm Carrie Scully, and I help support the naturopathic medicine program. And um, we have several prerequisites that need to be um, taken care of before. And hopefully we can have a conversation with you about that um, before you apply. We love to get uh, transcripts review what you've taken, um, make sure you're on the right track. Um, so definitely hook up with um, either myself or there's two other admission advisors in ND. And we have our first um, deadline on November 1st. And that assures you um, a response back from us, yes, um, um, in, in January. We also have a February one. Um, and that allows you to qualify for a, a, a small scholarship. Um, there is a 3.0, um, GPA with that. And then the March one is the financial aid deadline. So we are here to help support you, um, along the way, answer questions, um, and, and, you know, just be that person that makes sure that you're taking the right classes. We're, we're looking for, um, you know, science-based classes um, and, you know, certain levels, and sometimes you're not aware of them. So um, yes, unofficial, unofficial transcripts are great um, for this portion when you're just talking to your advisor. When you are going to apply, we will be asking for official transcripts. So um, that is very helpful to, um, make sure you're on the right track and make sure we're having the conversations we need to before you're applying. So let me think. And then, yeah, I'll just, um, put this last one up, which has, um, contact information too. So. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So don't be afraid, make an appointment. We are available on Zoom, in person, or on phone. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Are we okay to ask questions now? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go right ahead. Hi, I'm Izzy. I live in Washington. Um, I have my earbuds, so if you can't hear me, I'll take them off. I can hear you um, just fine. So. Oh, good, good. So I have um, actually three questions. Um, the first question is, I am a registered nurse, so I get a lot of the emails from uh, the Department of Health. And one of the emails I got um, that I received earlier last week was about the um, prescribed schedule drugs. Do you know um, that it, that's pending? Um, they're trying to um, advance the scope of practice that, so that NDs are able to prescribe um, schedule two and to five substances. Yes. Do you know anything more about that? Or? Yes, that that is correct. So right now, um, 
what that is, and, and for those of you who aren't already in healthcare, um, you know, whenever there is a change essentially to the law, particularly in Washington, it, it is opened up for public comment. So that's what is going on right now. Um, and this is an initiative, it is championed by our state association. Um, so you, the profession is supportive of this change. Um, but basically what, you know, anyone, you know, within, within public con can give public comment on this and then that will go back um, uh, to be determined whether or not that rule goes through. But we're hoping for it, um, you know, and, and that is something that would, again, give, um, you know, a lot of the reason why naturopathic physicians do want an increased scope of practice is to offer alternatives um, to patients and to be able to sometimes take patients off of medications. Um, you know, it, we're, we're not always interested in prescribing more. We're often interested in, mm -hmm. in doing different things with patients, but because you need prescribing rights to be able to do that, um, uh, then that is sometimes very helpful to have. And in addition, there are naturopathic physicians who do work in settings where they do need that increased scope of practice. It would greatly enhance their ability to serve their patients. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're looking forward. Hopefully that will go through. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, two more questions. I'll keep yeah. them short. <laughs> uh, my second question is, I will be receiving my nurse practitioner license by the end of the year. Um, I see that there's prerequisites um, and I'm assuming that I won't have to do them, but I did graduate nursing school about eight years ago. So I don't know what your um, expiration date is as far as taking those. Cause when I went back to school, I had to retake AMP biology. Is that something that I would have to retake or should I have that conversation one-on-one uh, -on -one with my academic advisor? Yeah, so that's a that's a good conversation because there might be nuances that you know that apply to your situation that don't apply to others. Our general rule of thumb, just for for everyone here too, is you know usually if it's beyond seven years that you've taken your prereqs, um, we might ask you to take a refresher course um, in certain areas too. Um, however, if you've been working in the field and like using that knowledge, we often do not. Um, require that. So again, there's, you know, kind of nuances to every person's situation. So yeah, I would, I would encourage you to reach out to admissions and they can give you a little more guidance. Awesome. Thank you for that. And my last question is, I'm starting to understand uh, the natural medicine path. Um, you mentioned that there is a certificate that we can apply for, um, for functional medicine. Um, I hate to be the one to ask, but can you elaborate on the difference between functional medicine? Why would we want a certificate in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So yeah, the the functional medicine certificate, um, you know, it's for those um, students, graduates, um, who do want a little bit of additional training in functional medicine. Um, there are there is a lot of overlap in some of the philosophy and some of the modalities, but it's really a different framework, I would say, than naturopathic medicine. Um, functional medicine is a different framework, um, and they can work quite well together. There are functional medicine practitioners who are not NDs as well, um, so sometimes they use that just to, you know, kind of apply some of those principles. Um, beyond what their original training was as a medical doctor or nurse or, or whatever. Um, but I, you know, I think the, there is a, um, there are some students who really do want both, both credentials. There are some settings where functional medicine is recognized and maybe naturopathic medicine isn't or vice versa. Um, and so it gives kind of opens up more opportunities sometimes for residencies or for employment um, or just for their own knowledge. Um, they're interested in obtaining uh, both credentials. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Connor. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, there were a few questions in the chat here. Um, the honors and entrance scholarship, I believe the deadline is the priority deadline. So it's the November 1st one um, to be considered for that. Um, oh, it is the February 1st. Yeah, I, I, I'm, 
Yeah, you would probably know. Yeah, so, okay, so the November 1st deadline, the advantage to that is you will hear by January back. The advantage of, and and then, then our next one is February 1st, and that is uh, qualifying you for the scholarship. Oh, okay, great. And I don't know exactly when we get back on the February 1 date. Um, I haven't heard yet um, what, when, when that process is all wrapped up, but. Yeah, generally, yeah, generally, we do hold the um, interviews kind of in late February and into March. So I would say just to be on the very safe side, if you apply by the February 1st deadline, you'd probably know by April 1st. Um, it might be a little bit sooner, but for sure, I think you would know by by the um, beginning of April. So yeah, so about two months after same thing, same thing as November too. So question um let's see yeah okay i i think that was that kind of covers the questions in the chat yes um, hello yes please Can you go hear ahead me? yes so thank you very much for the information you're welcome i would like to ask about the scholarship so for example if i'm coming to your university with my scholarship like i have a sponsor uh, will you accept it? Will you accept? Oh, I'm not sure if I can answer that one specifically. That would probably be one that would be good um, to get with your advisor. I haven't come across that one quite yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and 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 it's always great to get in touch with um, our financial services. They mm -hmm. have all the information on mm -hmm. what's available for you specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is the and, loan working for Buster? A loan system? Like uh, if it's international one from other country, for example, if I get it from my country and come to the Buster? That I would definitely get in touch with financial services. And okay. they have, yeah, because... I, I want to make sure that you get the exact information, the correct information mm -hmm. for your mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the email for financial services is F-I-N-A-D-E at bestyear.edu. Can you repeat that, please? Yes, it's F-I-N-A-I-D at bestyear.edu dot edu so you can email them directly and um get a cor um, correct information for your situation okay okay i got you yes so um why and and feel free to raise your hand again you know if you have any other questions but i wanted to give dr simmerman a chance to speak and just talk a little bit mm -hmm. about you know, her clinical experience. Um, she has a private practice as well as faculty. So I will let her take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Claire Zimmerman, and I am a practicing naturopathic doctor here in the Seattle, Washington area. Um, I'm also a faculty at Bastyr. So I'll tell you about some of the things that I do. Um, I have a private practice in Seattle and I used to own my own, it was my own practice. I um, owned my own business there and now I've joined the larger practice there. At my private practice, I do take insurance. I take Medicaid. I also see cash patients. I do a lot of diversity of types of medicine. Um, I do some primary care, preventative care, um, but I also see a lot of chronic illness. So I treat a lot of environmental medicine illnesses. Um, that might be heavy metals, mold toxicity. I also do a lot of mind-body medicine techniques, so some biofeedback in practice, a lot of autoimmune conditions. Um, I also do a lot of physical medicine in my practice as well. So I do some cranial sacral and visceral manipulation. So it's a pretty broad, well-rounded practice. And then I share a space with many other doctors. And so we have an acupuncturist. He's an ND acupuncturist, some other doctors in the office focus more on gynecology or pediatrics. We even have a 
midwifery birthing center in the back. So we're able to kind of cross refer within the clinic and people can see who they want to see. And it's a, it's a great environment for our clinic, for our patients. And my clinic was started in about maybe 80, mid eighties by some of the original Bastyr graduates. They grad, were some of the earliest classes. And so a lot of people were born in our clinic that now our parents and their children have been born in our clinic. So We have a long tradition at that space, which is lovely. Um, and so at Bastyr itself, um, I teach many courses uh, over the years, but right now, currently I teach the environmental medicine class. So that looks at um, how different toxicants in the environment impact our health. Um, I also teach um, one of our counseling classes. It focuses on uh, behavioral health and behavioral medicine, as well as touches on some of biofeedback concepts and specifically motivational interviewing, which is a a uh, method within counseling to help improve people's behavior um, and make steps towards change. Um, I also, oh yeah, I also teach our physical exam diagnosis, which is one of the main classes that you'll, uh, a core class that you go through in order to learn how to do physical exam steps. So just this morning, we tested everybody on thyroid examinations and how to examine the neck and the lymph nodes. Um, sometimes I teach in the botanical medicine department because I studied herbal medicine for about a I don't know, one or two decades before coming to school. And uh, that's a deep passion of mine as well. And then I also run a shift at our Bastyr teaching clinic and it's, I've done regular shifts, but now I have a specialty environmental medicine shift. So treat a lot of chronically ill people. Um, it's a really very dynamic, busy shift that we, that we see there. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions um, that anyone may have about the program, what it's like to be a naturopath, what it's like fiscally on the other side or um, any questions anybody might have. Yeah, you have your hand raised there? Yes, hi. Hi. So I, I think I saw on the website that there was a residency program and I was wondering, is that the next expected step after this program, um, the naturopathic doctor? Do you want to answer that, Dr. Connor, or I can also? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, the, the so residencies are not required um, to be licensed in the profession with the exception of one state. Um, but most places where we're licensed, you don't need a residency. However, a lot of people do choose to do residency um, because they want to gain more clinical experience in a more mentored environment. Um, and sometimes, um, like Dr. Zimmerman was talking about environmental medicine, people may want to do more specialty learning too. And so some of the residencies are focused to, uh, you know, be for pediatrics or environmental medicine or something like that. Um, so that's typically the reasons why people choose to go into residencies. Um, it is sometimes a, a, a number of graduates may choose to do more like an associateship um, or even open their own practice right when they graduate too. So there's a couple different pathways there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Their questions right now. So one of the things I'm just anticipating what the question might be is people looking at both locations, like what's the, you know, kind of differences. Um, obviously the weather's a little bit different. <laughs> so that's one thing that may be enough of a draw for you. You know, I, I respect that if, it, if that is the case. Um, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, we're a little bit better established as a profession in the Seattle area. And so you will find more practitioners here, but there are quite a few now in the Southern California area. Um, some of the differences, you know, there are more programs on our Kenmore campus. So if that's something that really interests you, um, that that will probably kind of put that maybe a little bit over um, in that area. Right now, we offer the counseling program um, and one of the nutrition programs at the California campus. 
um, but we um, offer acupuncture, counseling, nutrition, and the public health degrees, um, as well as midwifery on the Kenmore campus. So there are more degree options if that's something you're looking at as well. So that may be some of the differences, you know, they, they definitely have a slightly different flavor, you know, it is a little more laid back in San Diego, but you know, um, but Seattle is, is also very West Coast. It's just a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I, I think at both locations, you know, you will definitely find um, students, you know, who you resonate with, you know, faculty who you resonate with. There's, um, as we've been kind of mentioning, there's a lot of diversity within the profession. So, you know, it's your you're, um, you know, we're, we tend to be very eclectic practitioners. Um, so I think no matter where you go, you will find somebody who, who probably you resonate with as well. So, so there's a question, Tavana, saying your name right. Hi, yes, thank you. So my master's degree is um, in public administration and it's more than seven years ago and it's definitely not science-based. Can you talk, I noticed that there's a prerequisite it's like a year program. Can you talk about that? Or or do you just recommend doing community college credits? Yeah, you can do sure. definitely do community college credits. Um, that's usually the cheaper way to go. There are some online options that you can ask uh, for to review with your advisor. Um, but Yes, if you generally in a, in some cases will if they're past seven years, we will have you take them. Um, and we can definitely review if you have a particular community college that you're looking for, we can um, kind of go to, together and, and look and figure out which classes you need to take. And we, we do offer pre, many of the prerequisites um, on campus or, or through Bastier. Um, some students choose to do that because, you know, they get they want to get a little more accustomed to the university. Some of the um, instructors teach in both the graduate programs and the undergraduate programs. The prereqs are considered like our undergraduate. Um, so um, sometimes you get a little more insight into a professor that you might be working with in the future. Some some students really like that or, you know, just being around the campus a little bit more. Um, they're also offered in, you know, kind of ways that may work for you or not to, um, meaning, you know, there's a lot more flexibility, like Carrie's saying with, you know, community colleges, you can often, you know, take three courses at a time, whereas we might offer something once a year, but, you know, there's pros and cons of each. So, you know, we're, we're happy to help you work through what might be best for you. So. Thank you. Magalie? Question? Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I was going, oh, I'm going to ask a simple question. Um, sure. um, if you wanted to visit the campus, would you have to make an appointment for that or do you just show up and um, <laughs> ask questions there? Oh, good question. Yes, we actually ha can, you can enroll in having a tour in either location. You can do so about a month ahead of time. Um, and you could also schedule a time to meet with your advisor during that time as well. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I would add to, you know, if you're really interested in sitting in on classes, um, you know, we, we certainly welcome you to do that. For that, uh, you may want to plan a little bit ahead just to make sure you're there on the right day for what you want. Um, yeah. But we can coordinate that as well. So once you have a, a date and a time and you let your admissions advisor know, they can reach out to the department and we can find some classes if you want to sit in on some classes. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taylor? Taylor, are you able to unmute or ask a question or maybe put it in the chat if you can't talk right now? 
Oh, your mic's not working. Yeah. <laughs> so feel free to put it in the chat if, if you can. Yeah. Yeah, prerequisites online or in person. They can be either. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so there are. Yeah, so there. So there are some onlines that would definitely work. Um, I, I probably the determining factor might be whether or not there's a lab attached to it, because some of the courses, such as like chemistry, we do um, require that you have a lab for it. So. But again, that's a great question that, you know, to maybe bring up individually if you're considering between a couple different options um, to bring that up with your admissions advisor and they can give you a little more guidance. So, okay. Rafaela, did you have a question? Yes, so this is a little bit more spe like specific, but... Um... And so I definitely want to schedule an advisor appointment, but I was wondering about the dietetic internship and like the dual tra dual degree track option. I know that takes another year. Um, and I was wondering, is that able to be like, does that apply for the dual track option? Or would that be something that I would complete afterwards? Because I'm in a dietetics program right now. So that's something I will complete. Or is that possible to be completed like within this practice? Because I know there's didactic hours included. So I was just wondering about that. Yeah, I'm I'm less certain on that one. Um, I because I have not dealt so much with the nutrition. Yeah, me neither yet. <laughs> I haven't come across. I can um, definitely yeah. reach uh, um, over email. Yeah, I think that may be good because then, you you know, we can learn a little bit more about your circumstances. Um, I, I do know that we, you know, the nutrition program is not one that is typically considered like a dual program, but there are students who do both. So I know there is a way that you can do it. Um, I, I'm just not sure of the exact pathway of how you get there. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a question for Dr. Zimmerman. Um, it seems like you have your hands kind of in a lot of different pots and you <laughs> are jumping around a lot. Um, definitely seems very admirable. And you had mentioned you're open to talking about um, the fiscal nature of that. And so is it out of necessity that you jump around so much or is it more where your passions lead you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think I'm uh, quite unique in that. Uh, however, I think that there's a fair amount of naturopaths that do a diversity of things. So I've just, I mean, I have always enjoyed doing many things. Uh, I've always had multiple, multiple types of jobs. For me, they all lean into each other and feed into each other. I love teaching. And so I learn every day that I teach, I learn and I like to share information as well. So it's a, it's a reciprocal, um, it's a reciprocal relationship that I, so that I gather there. And then I really enjoy my private practice, but I wouldn't want to do only private practice. So it is not out of financial need whatsoever. And um, I could make a good living doing any one of the things that I do. Um, but I like to do many things. I've also um, written some, I'm published in some journal article, you know, journal uh, journals um, about some, with research. I've also written in some books for um, some of our, um, they're less glamorous, but kind of study guides for some of our clinical boards. And so, you know, I like to do that kind of work as well. And it's really, for me, I just, I mean, okay. So if you are just, an, if you stay as a clinical naturopath, meaning you have a private practice and you work with patients every day, every single day you will learn something new. And if you are a curious person and interested in, in that and not being bored, it, I think medicine in general and definitely naturopathic medicine 
um, allows you to have continuous daily learning and curiosity and you can explore new modalities and you can always learn more. Um, and, but for me specifically, I like to do it many things. Like for example, right now this year, I'm teaching the first year students. Whereas in the past I had mostly done fourth year and third year students. And I'm loving teaching the first year students because there's this fresh mind. It's reminding me of the basics of the medicine. It's getting me out of kind of being you know, you sometimes you get siloed into your, your little world of your private practice. And it reminds me of why everyone comes to this medicine in the first place. And I get to revisit our principles in a much deeper way. So that's just, that's just me. And many of my colleagues say you should need to choose one path, but that's just not who I am. And I also, what I don't do is I don't work in our political realm. A lot of our colleagues are very active working, um, you know, for our various professional organizations, the the national organization or various state organizations. And I don't want anything to do with that. I'm really glad that they do that. <laughs> so it kind of depends on what you want to do. Some, some people in our profession work for supplement companies, or they teach a lot of classes to the public or do different things like that. So it kind of depends on your own passion. So I've, let me know if I didn't answer your question fully. I'm happy to say more to that. No, that was great. Love it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's it's there's really a lot of different options out there. You know what what I've seen. You know, I I graduated in two thousand one, so you know it's been an, a, a couple decades now since I've been out. What I've seen, you know, kind of with my classmates and the people who graduated around that time, it's you know they often kind of started out doing a lot of different things too, but have focused more and specialized more as time has gone on, which of course I, I think you would expect, right? So I, you know one thing that I think is really nice about the profession is that you know you do have many different options and you can kind of explore that early on in your career. And then, you know, what tends to happen is, you know, people get a little more tracked in, not like Dr. Zimmerman, but, you know, kind of more focused on maybe doing a private practice or owning a practice, which is also kind of a slightly different skill set. Um, and, um, you know, or teaching or something else. And so they, they get a little more specialized as time goes on. Um, and, you know, just it, there was a question, too, about salary projections, and I'll, I'll put a link to the ANMC um, uh, survey for that, because that has some good idea about projections. But as you can imagine, with all the different opportunities that people have, there can be a pretty wide difference in incomes. So it's really hard to be very precise in that area. Um, I can say kind of overall trend wise the people who tend to do best financially are people who own their own practice where there's other practitioners who who work under them not surprisingly there tends to be you know kind of the biggest um uh, incomes in that area however that is a a, a different like skill set that not everyone wants to pursue. Many people just want to join another practice. And so they are willing to kind of settle for more moderate incomes um, because of that. Um, depending on where you are in the country too can make a big difference. Um, there's actually some recent information showing that if you're in a pre-licensed state, you might actually do a little bit better financially for some people, um, which is an interesting turn. I think that's because you may only have cash patients. You don't have to deal with insurance at all, um, which, you know, is, is a, um, I would say a frustration throughout all of healthcare is, you know, kind of dealing with third party payers and so forth. Um, so there's kind of a wide range in what you'll see. You'll also find, I think, a fair number of people, and you almost never see this in amongst medical doctors, for instance, who are part-time practitioners intentionally because they want to be, because they are pursuing maybe writing or, you know, they they do a blog or, you know, they do telehealth or something else that's not like really conventional practice. Um, so again, they're, um, it, it's kind of skews sometimes a little bit the income projections that are possible. But, um, you know, you certainly can have, um, you know, a very full practice if you're practicing full time um, and you're pretty well established five to 10 years out, you tend to have kind of the, the higher end of the income there. Um, and especially as time goes on, because 
um, you know, you get more specialized, you get better known, especially if you stay in a community, um, you tend to have a, a um, you know, a longer standing practice that does, um, is more stable financially. So like the practice of the Dr. Zimmerman is in, you know, was started by people, you know, decades ago who, you know, continue to kind of bring on other practitioners. So, yeah. And then um, the other part of the question was about class hours and study hours. So <laughs> um, Dr. Zimmerman, do you have any uh, advice and some guidance in that area maybe? Yeah, um, Tavana, so, Class hours, um, I, I don't know if I can exactly speak to that. I mean, I think you need to consider it absolutely a full-time, I mean, it's full, it is full-time completely. And then there's the, the study hours are what can really, um, kind of depends on how efficient you are and how you study. Um, so an example, I mean, as you can tell from my line of work, I tend to do a lot of things. And so I had, I, I overshot my um, electives necessity because I was so passionate when I was in school. I had advanced preceptorships. I had, um, where I was going to other clinics and I was basically filling every like hour of my day with some kind of studying. And then I would study a little bit in the evenings and I would try to have I, I, I aimed to have one whole day off each week, but you're really pretty committed for, I would say six days a week. And that might include evenings. Some people can be, but I always took more credit load than is, ne is necessary. And, and you can spread out your curriculum if you need to. I was a four year track person and I did as much as I possibly could within that. And I was doing a lot and I had capacity for it, but I also, you know, um, knew my boundaries and knew if I was taking on too much and I reined it back. So, but you, you definitely want to know that you're entering into a full-time beyond full-time commitment with classes, with like the, the time you're sitting and learning in class and, and then your online content outside of class and studying. But again, the studying really varies on how you learn and how efficient you are, which of course, if you haven't been in school for a while, there's a little learning curve of that, which honestly is where prerequisites can be helpful. Like I'd been out of school a very long time when I went back and doing my prerequisites really helped me figure out how do I even study again? And then I became very efficient at studying by the time I was back in school. So I don't know if, if you have more questions, Savannah, please ask them. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. And, we, you know, we we have a general rule of thumb, which is, you know, for every hour in class, you probably will spend uh, two hours outside of class preparing, reviewing, studying for that class. So it adds up pretty quickly. But again, you know, depending on how efficient you are, your personal background, you, you know, especially your science background in the first couple of years, um, and then, you know, kind of what your other interests are, whether you just kind of stick to the to the courses or you do some of these extra curricular things and extra clinical opportunities and and all of that, um, you know, can extend, you know, the the time that you're spending during the week. So, yeah. Yeah. So we are we are on quarters and um, yeah, it, it so. If you're coming from semesters or even trimesters, quarters are intense. So I, I had semesters in my undergrad and it is entirely different with quarters. They go really quick. Um, and, uh, you know, so just be aware of that. It, it, it is it is different because you're turning over things quicker. Uh, you know, on the flip side, we do have a lot of classes that run essentially all year. So um, the 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 big class that Dr. Zimmern teaches, for instance, um, you know, physical exam diagnosis, that is a class. It's three separate classes, but it's essentially the same class that, you know, is taught all year um, by the same instructors, similar format and so forth. So there it's not quite a turnover of a completely new class every single quarter, but, you know, because there are a number of classes that that uh, run for a full year. Um, uh, but but it is it is a little bit different, certainly for quarters, um, if you're used to semesters, especially so. So housing, yeah, Kenmore, um, we do have housing on campus um, in Kenmore in the student village. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, so so a number of students do take advantage of that, especially if they're moving from somewhere else. It's a it's a nice a nice way to do it because you don't have to worry about looking for an apartment when you get here. Um, and the student village is really beautiful. It's you know it's eco certified. It's um, they're clusters essentially, so they're they're single rooms with a bathroom, and then you have a common kitchen and living area. And I think there's I can't remember how many, maybe twelve students carry do you know is it 12 maybe? yes there's 12 mm -hmm. yeah so so it's it's kind of a little hybrid it's not like your super traditional undergraduate dorm but um it's a little bit different yeah, yeah. um yeah and nearby Canmore is very popular it's the closest town um Bothell is also very close and Kirkland's another one that's very close too so um and some students, especially as they get closer to the third and fourth year, they'll live um, closer to the clinic, which is located in Seattle. And the neighborhood is Wallingford, if you're familiar with Seattle. Wallingford, Fremont. It used to be Wallingford. Now they call it well, now they call it Fremont. It's like Fremont's creeping up <laughs> the road. But um, yeah, so a lot of students, because your fourth year is entirely clinic and classes that are held at the clinic. Um, so you don't really come to campus um, it, it, during your fourth year. So many students will live closer to the clinic or or halfway in between um, to make it easier for them. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and housing, unfortunately we do not have housing in San Diego right now. Um, uh, our location has has not offered the opportunity for that yet because um, it's, it, it's not a campus in the same way. Um, in San Diego, students really live kind of all over the place, although there are quite a few who live near the campus. Um, you know, and there there is some affordable housing near the campus, although there are also some very expensive towns near the campus, um, such as La Jolla, which you know, probably a lot of students can't afford on a student budget. It's beautiful, but that is nearby campus. But there is a, a very large university there. So there is also student housing that's, you know, kind of more affordable that is available around the San Diego campus. So, yeah. And yeah, and ages, there's there's definitely a range. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we we do have students, you know, virtually, you know, of every age um, entering. Um, I believe our median usually hovers around 27, 28, something like that um, for the entering students, um, you know, so, it, but there, you know, there are students who come straight from undergrad. There are students who, this is their second or even third or fourth career, um, you know, by the time they enter. So, yeah. Ah, yeah, so applications, um, applying to one campus or both. Yeah, Carrie, can you talk about Yes, bit? Yes, just, just one. We do evaluate them as a whole university, but you will be picking one or the other currently on our application. Yeah. Although, you know, if you do change your mind, you and you, and that happens a lot, you know, um, so students apply for one campus, we just ask that you tell us if you are, would like to move to the other campus. Um, once you're in the program, if you decide to transfer between campuses, it's a fairly easy procedure. It's a pretty simple form. As long as you're in good standing, you can transfer to the other campus and you, you pretty much just pick up you know, with with the cohort there. So, yeah. Uh, Izzy, you had a question? Yes, hi. I'm just curious. Do you guys find uh, medical doctors um, going into the program? Because I, I find that alternative medicine is becoming more popular uh, within the last decade or so. Yeah. Um, occasionally, um, you know, we don't... Uh, so occasionally we will have... Um, students entering the program who already have some sort of a, a medical degree, whether that's, um, you know, kind of conventional medicine, allopathic, osteopathic, chiropractic, you know, um, nurse practitioners, um, you know, there is kind of a range of different practitioners. Um, it, it, you know, it tends to be because 
there's only um, so much that you can transfer in, it is still a pretty big commitment. Um, and for many people who already have medical degrees of some sort, they, um, I think they often find that it's, it's, they do not want to go to medical school again, um, you know, and there, there is a limitation even for a medical doctor on what we can transfer in. Um, we try to do as much as possible, but we do have some limitations there. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. You, yeah. you mentioned transfers. So do students typically, um, are you guys allowed to transfer credits? Yeah, so if if you do have something like a medical degree, um, then uh, you sometimes can, you often can transfer in, you know, credits for that. So for instance, um, if someone took USMLE step one, um, they don't have to take any of our basic sciences because we know you've already kind of met that bar um, for your basic sciences in another program. Um, we do transfer also from other um, ND programs if they're accredited. Um, again, there's a limit on how much you do and it the curriculums don't usually line up. So sometimes people do have to repeat things or take things in a different sequence than originally intended, but uh, we do accept transfers from other ND programs as well. Thank you. I just learned how to lower my hand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, AB. Uh, yeah, Anthony. Hi. Um, I had a question um, for Dr. Zimmerman. Um, you had mentioned earlier about owning your own practice and then um, switching and, well, not switching, but now working in tandem or in alignment with another practice. And I just kind of want to hear more about that story. What were the kind of detriments of having your own practice or benefits and vice versa with me working in partnership with the uh, other practice? Yeah, so... There's a lot of different arrangements for how you can uh, work for yourself. Um, so what I was doing was I was renting space in a larger clinic. So I had a set cost every month. So there's other arrangements where somebody can work as an independent contractor and that clinic will do their billing and then you get a percentage and it's different things like that. So what I was doing is I had a set rent fee every month and that paid also for my front desk. So they would answer the phones, do my scheduling, but then I paid for all my other things. So it's kind of like a space within a clinic, a little bit of front desk support. But what I found was, as you heard, I had multiple jobs and I was only at my clinic, you know, and how often I was at my clinic varied. I really liked the freedom. I like the autonomy. I like to be in control of what I'm doing. I don't like people telling me what to do too much. So um, I enjoyed that. But the cost of my rent compared to how often I was working, I just wasn't pulling in as much profit as I would like. And then cross refer like I still work in the the exact same room in the exact same building I just decided to finally join the bigger practice that was there um and so for me it was also about being able to cross refer within the practice and I really liked that model of having many um doctors under the same uh like business title so if a patient comes in once as a new patient then I they can see anybody in the practice and I could say oh go get your your gyne exam with them go get you know your whatever it may be with the other doctor or, or they could see them other, instead of it being a different visit that they establish a new, new visit with the other person. And so for me, it was more about working part-time and the overhead expenses, which are always the thing. And then, um, it took a load off. And I mean, there's a whole other side to it. Like I ended up having a baby and all these things and it made more sense, but I probably was going to make that switch regardless of that. Um, if I, was working more full time, I would have stayed working for myself probably, but it's also it's all about the overhead, really, is what it comes down to. Um, so if I was paying for one or two days a week, it would be very different. Yeah. Any more questions on that, Anthony? Uh, no, you, you you did a great job, Anthony. I'm sorry, I've got my hands full right no, now. No, your daughter is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that is one of the, um, you know, some people love that they can own their own practice. They they want to do that, like even from the time they're students, they want they know they want to do that. They want to get out there 
I had a classmate, he like literally like graduated and like drove back to the East Coast, opened his own practice, like, the, you know, like within months of graduation, you know, so, so yeah, you have, you know, people who really want to do that. They love the business end of things. They, you know, they want to bring in other practitioners. They have a vision for, for all of that. And then, you know, a lot of practitioners just find that it's a lot easier to join someone else's practice, either as independent contractors, an employee, um, um be, and they just don't want to deal with kind of the hassle of that and yeah I mean it's it's a lot to own your own practice so I owned my own practice for a number of years and I was in a pre-licensed state so you know that kind of added to the complications and you know it it, it definitely had some advantages um but uh you know if I was was to practice here again in Washington I'd probably choose a different arrangement just given my circumstances and yeah, and you know, you can change it, <laughs> change as, as things go along too. So, you know, sometimes people do build a practice and then they decide that they want to sell it or, you know, pass it on to someone else and they end up, you know, doing something different afterwards. So, yeah. It's a great question, though. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? It's, it, we're a little bit, you know, I, I expected we'd go over a little bit over six. So, you know, if you have to leave, please, please feel free to depart. Um, you know, you don't have to stay. But, um, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to stay on and answer that. And yeah, I hope this was really helpful for people. You're, you're welcome for all that. Yeah. <laughs> No problem, Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you for joining. Yeah. I'm going to head yeah. out, but it was nice to see you all. If you have any other questions, just reach out, okay? Yeah. So, yeah. So, feel free. You know, you have, um, I'll be sending out um, to everyone who registered, um, sending out the recording and the um, slides for this. So, you know, feel free to. Uh, peruse at your leisure. And if you have any follow-up questions, our um, contact information is um, in the presentation. So please feel free to uh, follow up with any of us. And, and if we can't answer, we're happy to put you in contact with others who can. So, and thank you all again for your attention and your great questions tonight. It was really nice to meet you all. Bye.